Welcome, everybody, and thank you very much for coming uh, this evening to discuss what is both, I think, uh, an easy topic and also a difficult topic. Uh, easy because breast cancer is a big deal. Uh, difficult because I think that there, as most people in this room probably know, there is emerging evidence that's starting to call into question some of the things we've thought about in terms of breast cancer and breast cancer screening. So when I was asked to give this presentation, my first thought was, run. Um, because if any of you have read the newspapers, you know that there is a lot of controversy around this topic. And then I thought to myself, no, this is a great opportunity for me as an oncologist to sit down and think about this again, because I don't really think about screening as much as an oncologist, because as an individual who treats cancer, of course, I see people once a diagnosis has been made. So all of the hard upfront work in terms of the uncertainty and trying to figure out what's going on happens before I see people. And those are the individuals that Dr. Risden sees. And I'm very, very pleased to be here with her tonight to sort of talk these things through a little bit from our, our different perspectives. And what I'm hoping to do over the next 25 minutes or so is to go over uh, some of the evidence. And I decided not to water it down too much, although I'm going to try to keep things, um, I'm going to try to have things go not too, too deep, but I am actually going to be showing you some of the actual evidence that sits behind what we read in the newspapers. And I think that it's important to do that as opposed to just sort of give you the very top level of it because it unpacks a little bit about what that controversy is. So what I'm going to do is open up with a little bit of discussion about breast cancer statistics and some of the epidemiology of the patterns uh, involved in breast cancer just so that we're all kind of thinking the same things. I'm going to talk a little bit about the rationale for screening, and then we're going to talk a little bit about what is screening exactly, how does it work, what are its pros and cons, why does it work or why does it not work. We'll then go into the breast cancer screening studies specifically, and I'm going to be a little bit, I, perhaps a little bit selective, although I'm going to talk about the ones that are mostly uh, driving what we read in the news and driving, I guess, the policies about what are happening in terms of breast cancer screening. Um, look and think a little bit about what the numbers are really telling us, although I think some of that will come out in some of the, uh, the Q&A, and I think Dr. Risden is going to talk a little, bit about, uh, a little bit about that as well, about some of the upfront discussions people have. Um, and then remind ourselves about what the current recommendations are for screening, particularly in Ontario. So, breast cancer statistics. I don't really need to tell this crowd, I mean, uh, who, are, who are here and interested already, that breast cancer within the cancer world is considered to be a relatively big deal. But what are the things that we see? Well, it's the second, it's the most common uh, cancer amongst women. It's the second leading cause of cancer deaths uh, amongst women. Uh, about 25,000 women now per year are diagnosed with breast cancer out of a total of about 190,000 new diagnoses of cancer uh, in Canada. Uh, it represents about 26 percent uh, or a quarter of all cancer cases in women. And the numbers that we see in the newspapers are things like 67 women per day uh, are diagnosed with breast cancer. Breast cancer is, in some individuals, a lethal condition, can lead to death, which is really the thing that we're trying to avoid. About 5,000 women a year die of breast cancer, although that number continues to fall. Uh, and on average, about 14 uh, Canadian women per day die from breast cancer, which are some of the numbers that we hear that start to get us sort of riled up and obviously concerned. What's important, though, is to recognize that breast cancer is something that affects women differently at different stages in their lives. And although the worry tends to be in individuals who are younger, and of course we hear the anecdotes of things that happen in individuals that are younger, it really is a cancer that affects people as they age and is most common uh, in individuals between the ages of 50 and 74. Most women uh, who are diagnosed with breast cancer don't really have a family history of it. And in fact, a very small percentage of women are considered to be high risk, only about 1% of the population. So although we have this notion that it's very high risk and it's very common uh, and there's a lot of reasons for it, the fact of the matter is that most of the time it's sporadic. And as an oncologist, we sometimes, when we're meeting with people, and often when people are given a diagnosis, of course, the first question is always, why? Why did this happen? And in the, for the most part, we can't say why which can be obviously quite frustrating. So, what is this thing exactly called cancer? Well, cancer is essentially the unchecked growth of a cell in the body, meaning that a cell in the body decides that it's not going to listen to its instructions anymore. 
it's going to start to grow in an unregulated fashion. And eventually, that growth is going to start to cause problems. And cancer always starts in one cell in the body, which become two and four and eight and so on and so on, and grows over time. And it takes many of these what are called doublings for the cancer to reach a size at which it actually either becomes apparent or more importantly, when we can detect it. And at some point, the cells will spread into other parts of the body outside of the breast, such as the lymph glands in the blood. And this is where it really gets worrisome. And as people were trying to figure out how cancer behaves, our thoughts and I guess our hopes were that it would start in a cell and grow for a while where it started and eventually it would start to spread to other places which suggested the notion that if you caught it early you can prevent something from something more severe from happening that's really what underlines undermines the the, the whole notion of screening it's important to recognize though that the lump that can be felt is actually many many billions of cancer cells that take a long time to develop the other important principle in terms of cancer biology to understand is that when the cancer goes outside of the breast, generally speaking, it's felt to be incurable. And that's what we're trying to avoid. This is a very interesting study, and I just put this slide up just to kind of, again, give you a, you know, a flavor for the fact that, again, when people come to us and they say this was found, how long was it there? How long did it take to develop? On average, breast cancer doesn't actually grow that quickly. It takes some time to actually go from one to two to four, et cetera, cells. This was a study that was done by some radiologists that showed and it suggested that it took about 32 doublings, which can take place over a period of years to actually get to, the peri to a size that's big enough to de detect with some kind of imaging, some kind of test, um, some kind of x-ray, if you will. We tend to br uh, group breast cancer into what, are we, what we call staging groups. And you'll see this when you, think, when you read about breast cancer as well. And what we're trying to do is, of course, find breast cancer when it's occurring at an early, what's called a stage, so that we can prevent it from becoming a later stage. And this is an important piece of information to park as we start to talk about screening and what's it's achieved, because this is a way to describe how people are presenting to their doctors. And as you can imagine, if things are successful at picking things up earlier, you would expect that you should start to see a pattern of people being seen with an earlier stage. The other part of this slide, and this is actually a CCS, a Canadian Cancer Society slide, which shows that for the very early stages, sorry, in the earliest stage of breast cancer is stage zero, and it's given a zero, why? Not because it's not existent, but because there's a cancer cell that hasn't started to invade. That's called a precancer or ductal carcinoma in situ which is a relatively new diagnosis and really came up only when screening started because, of course, before screening, most women went to their doctors with a lump. They weren't, they weren't going for a test beforehand. And the survival in individuals with stage zero breast cancer is 100%. So obviously, we want everybody in that group if they're going to get something. For stage one, where the cancer has actually started to invade and has made a small lump but not really gone anywhere else in the breast or in the lymph glands, Currently, the survival is about 98%. For stage two, when it's gotten a little bigger or gone into a lymph gland, the survival rate goes down to around 88%, but it's still quite high. And these numbers are very different than they were 30 or 40 years ago. And that's something else that we're going to have to discuss tonight. And then obviously, as the stages increase, the survival goes down. So the theory is, therefore, that if we catch it early, the cancer is going to be more curable. And if we're good at what we do in terms of catching the cancer early, that more cancers are going to be found at a lower stage, fewer cancers are going to be found at a later stage. As well, one would hope that less treatment would be needed because things would be less advanced. Fewer people ultimately would have their lives shortened by this scourge. And overall, people should live longer as well. So that's the basis of it. So what is screening exactly? Screening is basically trying to find something before you know it's there. It's the idea of checking for a disease or an illness in people before symptoms develop, such as a breast lump or, breast lump or enlarged lymph nodes. It's important to recognize that screening, and people mix these things up a lot, the whole notion of screening and prevention, because that's a lot of the backbone of what we talk about when we say, go see your doctor. And I think it's important to recognize that screening does not prevent breast cancer, right? This is about finding something that was going to be there. It's a little bit further downstream. And if a screening test finds something, the screening test itself does not diagnose cancer. It says there's a problem, and you need to look into this more as well. That's the concept of screen. Similar to, you know, if you have a net and you're trying to 
cast it to try to catch something in the ocean or catch fish. You'll cast lots and lots of things. That's, uh, that's a nice analogy that some people give. So it's important to understand that a screening test is not the same as what's called a diagnostic test. A screening test is identifying something that's asymptomatic who may have the disease. So you're trying to find a group of individuals who you probably have to look at more closely. And that will then lead to a diagnostic test, which is trying to determine whether that thing is actually there or not. And for cancer, the only way that you can tell that a cancer is there or not is to take a sample of it. So that's either take a biopsy or remove it. And it's important to remember that because when we start to talk about the harms or the downsides and thinking about things like overtreatment, that's what people are starting to talk about, is about finding things on a scan, having to investigate them when something isn't actually there and putting somebody through a procedure like that. So what makes a good screening test? Well, generally when you think about it, I mean a good screening test is one that finds all the problems. Um, and, you know, everything that it finds is a problem. If it doesn't see anything, it guarantees that there's not a problem. That's the best screening test. Of course, the best screening test could cost millions and millions of dollars. So, pragmatically, a good screening test has to meet some other sort of criteria for it to be able to be applied across a large group of individuals who don't have any symptoms. It needs to be simple. It needs to be easy to do. It can't have multiple steps. It needs to be done fairly quickly. Uh, people aren't going to spend, you know, six hours in a hospital going through a series of investigations, especially when they're otherwise feeling well. From a societal point of view and from a government's point of view, it's got to be relatively inexpensive. Um, it's got to be safe. It's got to be available generally to everybody. Uh, and it's got to be acceptable to the individuals who have to, who have to undergo it. Mammography. This is where mammography landed. And where did mammography come from? I mean, everybody knows what mammography is, but what is it really? Mammography is basically taking an x-ray of the breast, making a picture and looking at shadows. And essentially, anything that's white that has an irregular pattern or shape to it could be suspicious for a breast cancer. But there are lots of things that can make a mammogram look white. Interestingly, and I hadn't actually realized this, mammography was developed by a German surgeon, in fact, who was seeing lots of women with breast cancer. And at that time, all you could do was a mastectomy because of the fact that at that point, in the early 1900s, obviously there was no screening, and very few people were coming, even with what we would consider today to be a small lump. People tend to wait, tended to wait, and would come with very, very large, very, very large breast cancers. Breast cancer was sort of very, very feared, and some, somewhat you know, has been put into, uh, you know, put into our culture as something very fearsome based on that history. But what this individual did, is what sometimes happens magically in medicine, is that he was looking at this problem, and then he had a colleague down the hall that was playing with these things called x-rays. He said, hey, maybe your thing down there can actually help me. And he, what he started to do is actually he did mastectomies, and then he took x-rays of the mastectomy specimens. So he actually took the breasts that were removed that he knew had cancer in them and did x-rays to look at the patterns of what they looked like. And then somebody got really smart and said, wow, this is something that's really cool to do, and maybe we can actually do it before people have a very advanced disease. And that's really where mammography came from. And in fact, it was really pushed forward by this individual called Robert Egan, who is a pioneer in Houston, Texas, who in fact, in his history, his wife actually succumbed to breast cancer. And uh, you know, as you, if we, if we had all night, we could tell lots and lots of stories, but many of these stories are about individuals who are personally affected, of course, because anecdotes are incredibly powerful. But what he actually ended up doing was, whereas the German surgeon was, of course, looking at big obvious things, this individual had the idea, maybe we can find it before we even know it's there. Maybe we can find it before we can feel it, and actually did some studies on individuals that started to show these shadows that were only a few millimeters in size, quite small. Um, and that's really wh where the birth of mammography came from. And that's when people started to think about the fact that they were seeing lots of people with breast cancer, and maybe we can actually pick it up earlier and the whole notion of population screening. Because it, in early on, it was a little bit mixed up. People were mixing up the idea of population screening, meaning offer it to everybody and potentially suggest it to everybody, as opposed to opportunistic screening, meaning when somebody comes and sees you as a physician or as a healthcare provider, make sure you talk to them about this problem, which of course would more likely select individuals who are more likely to go see a doctor. And those individuals might actually be a little bit different than people who don't see their doctor because maybe they're thinking about their health more. So people started to recognize that there were these differences between what's called opportunistic screening versus a little bit more, if you will, population screenings perhaps, uh, you know, to, to, to use maybe a bit of a data turn, a bit more paternalistic, 
we know it's good for you, so we're going to offer it to everybody and not even wait for you to come and ask. So when is it reasonable to screen? Well, you need to have a problem that's important. You need to understand who the individuals are at risk. The thing that you're looking for has to be well understood, and its natural history has to be well known. And generally, obviously, you need to have an accurate diagnostic test that's reliable. You also have to have effective treatment options. You have to also understand, or you, you have to think that earlier treatment probably makes a difference in what happens to people. The other nuance to this as well, particularly in breast cancer screening, is that the thing, the breast cancer, if you're going to do screening, probably needs to grow slowly enough that you can detect it over a period of time when you can do something about it. Because, of course, something that develops very, very quickly, a screening test is probably not going to be able to help very much. But there are also downsides, and people have to recognize that as well. One of the major downsides, and the one that we're going to talk about a little bit when we look at this evidence, is what's called a false positive. So somebody goes for that x-ray, and you see a little shadow, and the screening test says, oh, there's something there. And it's not really the screening test that says that says that. We didn't really go into this, but there's a human element to this too. Mammograms don't read themselves. They have to be read by radiologists. And radiologists are people, and radiologists have to make a judgment call. Um, and that can also sometimes affect a little bit um, how, the, uh, you know, how the x-rays are read. And there has to be a lot put in to what's called quality assurance to make people are consistent in how they read. But the false positive idea is basically seeing something that doesn't end up actually being a cancer. And when you're studying a screening test to see if it's useful, one of the things you want to keep track of is how many people did you find, how many people did the test find that ultimately didn't have the problem. And if that number is too high, and if that number is a lot higher than the actual problem, you have to start to ask yourself the question, is this screening test really useful? The other issue with the false positives, of course, is that you're going to subject a lot of people to more invasive diagnostic testing, particularly what we talked about before, the biopsies which are not comfortable if anybody's ever had one, any kind of a sample. Finding the other issue is that if you're wrong in how you thought the natural history of the problem you're looking for, uh, then what will end up happening is that you'll find some things that are growing very, very slowly that may actually not ever end up being a health problem for an individual in their lifetime. So now what you're doing is you're finding things and you're labeling somebody with a problem and you're saying this person has cancer. And people think, oh boy, cancer, and that has huge implications when, in fact, the individual may have a much more benign, indolent, or slow-growing process. So the test can pick some of those things up, too, and you have to be mindful of that. And that can also lead to problems when people come and see me, and that's a vignette that I'm going to give you a little bit of a spoiler at the end, about as an oncologist sitting there having, seeing somebody who has a very slow-growing cancer and having a discussion about whether or not we need to give any treatment and what the downsides of that treatment could actually be uh, in terms of causing problems. Obviously, there are very, very important aspects of the whole notion of uh, psychological distress and anxiety. It can be anxiety-provoking going for a test, particularly for a test for something like cancer. And there's the issue, of course, of false negatives, too. If you have a bad test and it misses the stuff that you're supposed to be picking up, or if it's saying everything is fine and the person you know, leaves and says, I'm going to be fine, and in fact there was something there, you've got a problem. So how do we figure out if screening for breast cancer works? Well, the only way is to do a scientific study, and that's really what I'm going to take you through now with some of the scientific research. And we're going to be talking specifically about breast imaging or mammography. There are two different ways that you can do a scientific study. The easy way is what's called an observational study, which basically observes what's happening naturally, meaning you don't control anything at all. You just let things happen. You put mammogram machines out, and you let people get to those mammogram machines either based on their own decision or a decision that their doctor makes. You don't, um, and you look at those individuals and see what happens to them against people who don't have a mammogram. And as you can imagine, there's lots of risk of what's called bias. There are lots of things can go wrong with that, partly because of the fact that you're letting people choose whether or not they want to have a test, and that can fundamentally skew the results of what you find one way or another. People may go for the test if they think that there's something wrong, that they wonder if they're actually feeling something as opposed to being completely asymptomatic, or their doctor may know something about them, uh, et cetera. So the best evidence typically still comes from what's called a randomized control trial, where you basically take, try to take bias out of the equation and try to take things that may have occurred by chance or things that may systematically make the test suggest that things are going one way or the other and sort of take that out of the equation. And that's really what randomization does. 
And what happens is individuals are randomly assigned to get the test or not. Um, and then obviously you need to follow individuals and see what happens over time. And in terms of studies for breast cancer treatment, there have been eight randomized control trials that started in the 1960s, extending through to 1982 with follow-up for up to 25 years. USA, in fact, the first randomized control trial was in New York, uh, in upstate New York, and it was a fairly flawed trial, but at least got things going. The other thing that really sort of got this going, in, in part, other than the technology being developed, was that Richard Nixon in the early 1970s declared war on cancer. Those people in the audience that remember Richard Nixon have a picture in their mind. But in any event, the declaration of war of cancer is still actually a little bit of our, it's still a little bit embedded in our culture and sometimes still becomes a little bit of our battle cry. And some of that language, that war and battle and fight language is still put in there. But that was one of the, the ways that he used to actually release funding from Congress to actually get things going. So that's a bit of an interesting historical point. The studies that were done were in women between the ages of 40 and 59, based on the observed patterns of when breast cancer was occurring, basically dialing it back about 10 years from when you were starting to see most people presenting with the cancer, thinking that that's when the catch individual's early period would be. And the follow-up, as I said, was between three and 25 years. So this schema just shows you what we mean when we say a randomized control, a randomized trial. So eligible women are identified, and then through a process, they are randomly assigned to either get the test or not. So you can see right now that one of the problems that could occur in a randomized trial is if you can't, you can't force people to have something. So some people who are randomized to get the test may not go for it. And some people who are randomized not to get the test may decide afterwards that they want to get the test and find a way to get it. That's called contamination. So you have to be very, very careful and keep track of individuals to see if there's contamination. And generally for doing these types of trials, particularly when you're not sure how big the difference may or may not be, you need to include many, many, many people. Um, so for the screening, it was really about screening versus no screening, but what was interesting in some of these trials is at that time, people felt that having a, what's called a usual care arm, meaning mammography often with a breast examination, versus nothing was unethical. So many of the women uh, in the, who were randomized to not get the mammography were actually offered a breast clinical examination, which kind of complicated the interpretation of the studies a little bit, and we'll go through that. And this is where Canada shines, because in fact the first one out of the gate that was the biggest trial, and it's also one of the most complicated, one of the most controversial, is the Canadian National Breast Cancer Screening Trial which was run by a group of individuals out of Toronto, epidemiologists and clinicians, uh, giving credit to Cornelia Baines and Anthony Miller, who are sort of legendary, because they were the ones that took the plunge and said, we need to do a proper big randomized control trial, and actually got it organized and got the funding to do it. So an important story for Canada. And again, the reason I put this slide up is not to confuse people, but to show you how much work went into putting this study together. This basically shows the study schema including the numbers of individuals that went down each one of the pathways. And I'm going to go over it a little bit more and show you some of the highlights. But the important thing to point out is this involved 90,000 individuals. This involved 90,000 individuals, half of whom were randomized to get basically a mammogram and half of whom were randomized to not get a mammogram. A fairly clean design and then obviously followed through in terms of what happened to them. So what happened? This is the, um, so these individuals were followed for about for up to 25 years. And this publication from the British Medical Journal, a very high-ranking um, medical journal, published these results, the follow-up results, uh, in 2014. And essentially, this is what's called a survival curve. So what you do is you plot out the proportion or the percentage of people who started against how many are left alive, if you will, over a period of time as you follow people along. So obviously, as time goes on, things are going to happen. I mean, we all eventually die, so people die over time. So that's why the curve is obviously going down. And what you're looking for is to see, did more people die of breast cancer in the arm that got mammography than the one that didn't get mammography? And the answer is no. Those two curves are essentially superimposable. The blue one, where, it, where in fact, if anything, the blue one is above the red one, meaning that the survival marginally might have been a little bit better in people who didn't get mammograms than did. And this slide, so that was for breast cancer survival, dying of breast cancer. The other question that you ask when you, do, when you do screening is you know that it's very complicated. People's health are very complicated. 
And if your screening test is really, really good, not only will people not die of the disease, but they just should not, they should be less likely to die overall. They should be healthier, especially if this disease is kind of driving what somebody's survival can be. So these are the over, what are called the overall survival cur curves, deaths from any cause. And again, if there was a big effect, you would expect to see a difference between these two curves. And what you're seeing here is that they're superimposable. And the unfortunate conclusion is that it really didn't seem to be making a difference. But one observation from this trial, because you can imagine this was debated. This study has been dissected numerous times. Other people have looked at the data. The data has been given to many, many individuals to look at. People can become very polarized in thinking about this study as well, because this was the hypothesis was mammography was actually going to be a benefit. So this is obviously not the finding that we wanted to have. But as scientists, we of course have to be open to the fact that we have to show what the truth is, whether we want to believe it or, you know, whether that's what we wanted to see or not. But one of the observations that was interesting is in individuals who were diagnosed with breast cancer, the individuals who were diagnosed with breast cancer on the screening arm seemed to live longer. So started to make the question, well, is something happening here? Maybe there is something here. People tried to dissect that out. And the question was, what's going on? And what ended up happening, and this is the issue of is the screening test really effective in relationship to the actual biology, what the disease is going to do, almost whether you, you, know, whether you treat it or not. And that's the, the concept of lead time bias. And what is felt to have happened on this study is that there were individuals on the mammography arm who were diagnosed with breast cancer who basically died when they were destined to die. But what ended up happening is that they were found a little bit earlier to have the breast cancer. The other way to think about this is if you had two individuals, sorry, who were twins starting at exactly this point. Sorry, is that working? The pointer's not really working. So if you have two individuals who start at exactly the same point who are gonna die at the same, at the same point no matter what you do, it's destined that those people are going to live for the same amount of time because of the biology of the disease that they have. That if somebody has something detected with screening early on, they're going to live for a number of years knowing that they had cancer. Whereas an individual who's not screened, who eventually develops symptoms, will be diagnosed with the cancer later. So this is a bit of an optical illusion. It suggests that people seemed to live longer after they were diagnosed. But in fact, all that was happening is you were maybe finding it a little bit earlier, but the person wasn't going to live any longer. And again, that's, it's a bit of a difficult concept for individuals to get their heads around, but this is one of the big controversies that comes up, particularly in things like screening. And the other question is, what else was happening over this period of time? Because the other thing that was observed is that generally speaking, the outcomes for breast cancer were improving around the world. And there were a number of reasons for that. One is the treatments were improving, and again, I'm gonna be a little bit biased because I give one of those treatments. We can talk about that a little bit if people have questions about it. The other thing is that we started to find that, in fact, many of the cancers are actually very slow growing. They're a lot slower growing than we thought they were. The other thing is, of course, over time, more people with breast cancer actually received treatment. One of the things that was different about the Canadian study than studies that were done in, the, um, in Europe was that in Europe at this time, there weren't a lot of treatments for breast cancer. So if you found it, people could have surgery, but there wasn't any other insurance policy treatment like hormone treatments that people get now, or chemotherapy treatments, or radiation treatment for that matter. Whereas in the Canadian trial, in fact, a lot more people were given those treatments. And some of the theory is that getting, having access to those treatments, whether it was found on a mammogram, or whether it was found without a mammogram when somebody developed a lump or a system, having that good access to that good a treatment kind of even things out anyways. So it's the quality of treatment. And the other thing that happened is, of course, there was a lot of news about this. So generally speaking, people were becoming more aware of breast cancer and weren't coming to their doctors with huge lumps anymore. They were coming to their doctors, if anything, with small lumps. Many of them were nothing, or cysts that were potentially getting over-investigated. And if you do a lot of investigations on a lot of people, you're still obviously going to find things, sometimes by accident. The other thing that was happening is that we were already kind of sold on this. It was. Uh, the fact of the matter is that even as these trials were going on, the provinces were already scrambling to put into place screening programs. And Dr. Risden is specifically going to give us some really nice examples of what it looks like on the, at, the family physician, at the family physician and patient level in terms of what these screening programs actually 
do in terms of informing people and encouraging them to come to screen. So the horse was kind of already, in a way, the horse was a little bit ahead of the cart, but there was a decision made to put into place organized screening. So it's in place, and it's currently in place, and this is just a, this just shows you the various different provinces and when the different screening programs were put in place, typically in the late 80s to early 90s. Well, to try to, tr try to make sense of all of this, a group of experts in Canada got together called the uh, Canadian Task Force for Preventive Healthcare, and in fact, the group that studies this particular problem is actually, has actually membership specifically in Hamilton. Um, and what they did was they wanted to look at all of the research to sort of put it together to come up with some kind of recommendations. Because obviously I showed you one trial, but there were a number of other trials, and some of them actually showed some positive results, although not dramatically positive. So what they did is looked at all of the studies and considered both the benefits and the harms of screening to come up with recommendations, and used a very rigorous process to do this. And really, this slide was really about the fact that they asked some very important questions, not only just about the screening work, but what are the actual harms of screening, how many people will go through screening and have to undergo a biopsy to make a diagnosis of cancer to look at what is the implication for a whole population. So the current guideline, which was an updated guideline, was created in 2011. And what did they suggest? Well, one thing was that it didn't seem to matter what kind of mammogram. People would hear about new technology and digital versus a mammogram that took a picture with film. And the sense was from those studies, there really wasn't much of a difference, although radiologists will argue that they think that there is a difference between the two. The fact of the matter is film's being thrown out anyways because nobody uses film for convenience, so all mammograms are digital now. But it, that's not to say that, in fact, digital is, ac is actually of higher quality. The other thing that they came up with all on these studies was that there was pretty convincing evidence that breast self-examination really didn't help anything at all. So telling a woman to routinely examine her breasts on a regular basis didn't really seem to make any difference at all. The other part was that having a woman's breasts examined by somebody else, usually a health provider, so a clinical breast exam on a routine basis, also didn't really seem to help anything. And that's actually gone into recommendations that people will now, you know, anybody who's been to their family doctor who's talked about it is going to have some discussions about how this got taken away. And this was a very hard thing to let go of because, of course, it was an easy thing to do. As physicians, we want to lay hands. This is the one thing we do to try to find things. So to say that that maneuver was of no use and it was a simple maneuver was a very hard, very hard pill to swallow. And there's a lot of controversy about it still. The other aspect is people say, well, what about newer tests? And at this point, the evidence, particularly for what we call average risk, not people at high risk, but for average risk, um, uh, MRI scanning really isn't recommended at this time. So this is one of the tables. So as I told you, I was going to show you some stuff that's, you know, I'm not going to go through it in a lot of detail, but just to show you that a lot of work went into putting this information together. And not only did they look at the studies and try to pool everything together to come with the recommendations, but also looked at things like the screening interval. Well, maybe if it doesn't work at every two years, maybe every one year, because there were some studies that looked at screening every one year versus every two years versus every three years. And the upshot was that they didn't find any difference. They were equally, I guess, good or equally bad, um, depending on your interpretation. The other thing that they looked at was this notion of the false positives. How many women are you going to send for a biopsy based on the mammogram result who end up not having cancer? And this is where some of the numbers come that, again, Dr. Risden is going to go through in, in terms of some of the decision aids. When individuals are coming to decide to have a mammogram and preparing themselves for the fact that what's interesting is that it's very likely that even if the mammogram shows something, it's not cancer. And then the question is, how do you feel about subjecting yourself to a biopsy or one's self to a biopsy? So, so the task force position, and this is sort of the federal, sort of the national position, if you will, for Canada for now, is a regular mammography. The one thing that these studies definitely showed is that regular mammography under the age of uh, 50 doesn't really, isn't really of, of value. So, and this has obviously been a contentious issue, and it was a much bigger issue in the U.S., because in fact the U.S. jumped on this because there were a lot of women getting mammograms in their 40s in the U.S. and continue to, to push to get mammograms. But unfortunately, there's not very much evidence that they're of any value for average risk women, not high risk women. For women age 50 to 69, it initially used to be every two years, but you can see how it got loosened a little bit to stretch to every two to three years. For women age 70 to 74, having a mammogram every, every, every two to three years. 
and we can talk about that a little bit because a lot of uh, studies didn't include women who were in their 70s, but one of the things you have to remember is that these studies, many of these studies were done in the 1970s and 1980s. Our life expectancy was different then. Our life expectancy is much longer now. So a woman in her 70s back then might have expected to only live 10 years or less, and now a woman in her 70s can expect to live for almost 20 years. So I think that that's partly a little bit of a, a pragmatism, if you will. The other thing, though, is at this point, based on the available evidence, and part of it, of course, is that the studies have not included women who are older, is that regular mammograms are not recommended for women over the age of 74. So there are lots of different task forces. And again, the reason that I put this slide up is to compare. This is the Canadian, uh, this is the Canadian advice on your left. In the middle is Cancer Care Ontario, and I have a final slide about the Cancer Care Ontario advice that you're going to hear more about when, when Dr. Risden speaks. The other is the U.S. Uh, task force. And the final one that I put up, ASCO, is the American Society for Clinical Oncology. And what I want to point out to you, which, is very, which was very interesting to me, and I hadn't realized, is whereas the task forces in public health are recommending some softening of screening, look at what the American Oncology Group is saying. They're saying discuss the necessity with a physician. They're not even recommending screening. And that's really where the firestorm came south of the border, whereas in Canada, we're not quite there yet. But you can see how, unfortunately, the evidence suggests that maybe we have to think about some things. The Americans have also done some interesting studies looking at population research. So the Americans have said mammograms are out there, people are doing them, fine, we've had these studies. There is this notion that there may be some benefit for some individuals. But what's happening on, to the population as a whole? And this was a study that was published in the New England Journal of Medicine, which is sort of the top tier medical journal, looking at women who were undergoing mammography in the US. And it basically was based on the hypothesis that to reduce cancer mortality from breast cancer, effective screening has to find more early stage cancers and result in a decline in late stage cancer diagnosis. You would expect that if you look at people, that the pattern of how they're finding, if mammography is effective, should be changing as a natural experiment. So remember I talked to you about randomized trials and observational. So this is an observational trial, a little bit messier, but you're looking at the whole population to see, are you starting to see those trends? And what they saw was that lots of women were getting more mammograms. These graphs are just showing the increase in the rate of, getting, of women getting mammograms in the US. And this graph is basically showing that there definitely was a jump in an earlier diagnosis, finding more cancers early, but there wasn't any difference in late stage cancer. And this is where the whole theory then came up that maybe we're starting to find things that we're never actually gonna turn into a problem. That mammography is finding these little spots in women's breasts that we are calling cancer, but if we never would have found, they would have grown so slowly or not grown at all that they never would have been a problem. And that sort of makes this question what do we mean when we say cancer too? Does it have to grow at a certain speed, even if it looks like something that's cancerous under the microscope? The Europeans also did a similar study, and what they did is they actually compared the survival from breast cancer between countries that had organized mammogram screening and those who didn't. And their assumption was that if mammogram screening was effective, that you should see a difference in survival being better in those countries that have screening versus those that don't. So again, a different way of looking at the problem. And again, these graphs show, um, the graphs that you see going up are basically the number of people being screened, and the other one that you see is basically the mortality curve between the countries. And the bottom line is that they're all superimposable. And this is their conclusion. You can read the whole thing to yourself, but I've highlighted in red, mammography screening by itself has little detectable impact on mortality due to breast cancer. This is a big deal because now it starts to make us question, why are we asking all these people, why are we asking people to go for mammograms? Are mammograms really as good as we thought that they were? It's the best that we have. And the recommendation that we come up with is go talk to your healthcare provider because you need to make an individual decision, which I think unfortunately is, you know, it's not a recommendation that people are, you know, that doesn't necessarily sit well, and it makes a lot of work for Dr. Risden, for sure. Cancer Care Ontario has parsed out the guidelines as well. The average risk guidelines are exactly the ones that I described to you, so we're in Ontario, so this is, this is sort of the world that we live in. But as well, there has been a recognition that in fact, maybe where most of the action is in individuals that have high risk. And in fact, recently there has been 
funding put into place and mechanisms put into place that for women who are identified as having high risk, so that means that at the outset they have a higher chance of developing a breast cancer, do have access to enhanced screening, which actually includes mammography. And we can talk a little bit about how individuals are diagnosed as being high risk. There are tools that you can, individuals can use to define what high risk is. A lot of it comes down to family history, uh, as well as individuals who are diagnosed with um, a genetic abnormality, but again, that's a very small proportion of the population. So what do I see as an oncologist? And I want to tell you the story as I end here about Prudence. So Prudence is obviously a made-up individual, but is clearly very prudent. And Prudence is a delightful 68-year-old woman who's very healthy, who did the right thing. She went for screening mammograms all the time. She didn't have a family history, average risk, no problems at all. So she went for her mammogram, and she was found to have a small 5-millimeter abnormality in her left breast on screening mammogram, and it was biopsied, and it was found to be a low-grade cancer. So she was not a false positive. She had a low-grade cancer in her breast. She went to the surgeon and was offered the standard lumpectomy, have the lump out, and have a lymph gland sampled, and that showed that it was a small cancer that hadn't gone, so basically very early stage one cancer. She's told that she has a very low risk, and she meets with all her oncologists, and she sees my colleague, the medical oncologist, who gives drugs, and she said, no, nah, I don't want any of that. That's not for me. But she does want to do something about it, because she's told that she does have a risk that we're not sure about, that the cancer could come back in her breast, and if she had a lumpectomy, she doesn't want to have a mastectomy, so if we can at least prevent it from coming back in her breast, maybe we've done something useful and helpful. So she comes to see me, and we hem and we haw about it, and we decide that we'll try some radiation. And Prudence has a bad reaction to the radiation. She gets very inflamed, and it takes her at least three months to recover, and her breast now is always sore because there's all kinds of scar tissue in her breast. And six years after the radiation, remember I radiated on her left side, and we all know that the heart is on the left-hand side. As a radiation oncologist, I do recognize the heart is an important organ. Um, she has a heart attack and sustains damage to her heart that limits her activities. And I asked myself the question, did I actually really help this person? And this is really what we struggle with when we start to think about picking up these early low-grade breast cancers, because the story is not necessarily, I don't think, about the size. I think that really where we're going with this now is we have to actually understand the biology of what we're finding. Not all cancers are the same, and I think that we have to do a better job of characterizing what is truly something that is a threat to somebody's health versus something that develops that we're just finding. So my summary slide is unfortunately perhaps a bit of a cop-out statement. The breast cancer screening is complicated, and I hopefully have shown you a little bit of the information that underpins that. Mammography is currently the best screening test we have. Based on what I talked to you before about the fact that it's out there, it's easy, it's simple, straightforward, safe, etc. But obviously you've seen that there are some limitations. We also recognize that screening is going to find lots of things, and that many of those will not be cancer, and that even the cancers that we find the things that we call cancer may not be lethal, which may lead to overtreatment. So screening may save lives, because we all have anecdotes, and we all know of somebody that had an early aggressive cancer that was found through screening. We can't deny that. Um, but not as many as we thought. And we still don't have, and as an oncologist, I have to admit that we still don't have a good understanding of the actual biology of breast cancer, so we need to find new ways of screening uh, to be investigated, and we have to carry on. So thank you very much. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to um, our very exciting, tantalizing international audience. It's really exciting to be uh, uh, enjoying a, a, wide, a wide audience to, to explore these very, very important topics. And um, I think Dr. Sussman just did a fabulous job of really establishing the background of evidence and, and knowledge about breast cancer screening. And I really want to emphasize the, the importance of breast cancer uh, to people in this room and, and to, um, to my practice as a family physician. It's, um, it's something people spend a great deal of time being concerned about. Um, it affects everyone's lives in different ways and, and really the, the, the energy all of us in this room are putting into the topic is very well founded because it is such an important issue. However, as, as Dr. Sussman has so lovely, uh, had done such a lovely job illustrating, it is not an issue that we have an easy way to, um, to, to prevent, to screen for, to give folks the reassurance that they are looking for, to give people who really care about their health the chance to invest energy in a way that they know exactly will benefit them and, and lead to the outcomes they're desiring. So I want to spend a few minutes talking about 
how I experienced the issue of breast cancer screening at the front lines. I'm a family physician. I practice in the West End Clinic just down the street here. And breast cancer takes up a lot of, of thought and energy in my work week and it is also very important for many of my patients. So I want to start by giving you a sense, and some of you in the audience have, have, have maybe seen these letters or received these letters, but I had a patient share with me um, their direct experience of the issue of, of, of mammograms and whether they should have one or not. So if you're a woman over 50 in Ontario, you will start to automatically receive letters from Cancer Care Ontario, and I, I want to tell you that Cancer Care Ontario is amazing. They're, they're cataloging people by age. They have a database that's way more effective than anything I can maintain in my own practice. They're finding a way to communicate with people to let them know of, of services that are available. They share the, the interest we all share in making cancer less of a, a scourge in our life. And so, amazingly, women will get a letter, and this, this is the first letter my patient received. You see January 21st, and I'll just, I know it's a bit hard to read on the screen, but I'll, I'll, I'll just read a few things that I think jump out at, from the letter. Um, breast cancer is one of the main causes of cancer deaths in Ontario. The chances of getting breast cancer are greater as you get older. Most women are, who are screened for breast cancer have normal results. Getting screened every two years is the best way to find cancer early. So those are messages that Dr. Sussman reviewed as well. They seem familiar to us, and they certainly are, are, are I'd say, issuing a fairly strong suggestion that screening is going to be a, a very important thing to consider. So January is a busy month, and uh, my patient didn't quite get around to phoning that number, and so uh, February 20th, letter number two arrives. An important reminder. A few weeks ago, we sent you a letter. It was to remind you to make an appointment to have a breast screening examination. It is important to have regular breast screening. So again, we have a consistent message. I think the, as I talked to this patient in, in hindsight, there's a bit of anxiety being raised by, um, by these letters. It's certainly being taken very seriously by Cancer Care in Ontario. And again, there's a lot of good reasons for that. March 3rd, the third letter arrives, and um, this is the statement that jumped out of me. On behalf of Cancer Care Ontario, I would like to thank you for taking care of your health by having a mammogram. So again, based on your records, you were due. We hear again that breast cancer is the most common cancer in Canadian women. women. And as a woman between the ages of 50 and 74, you were encouraged to get screened with a mammogram through the Ontario Breast Screening Program. So, you know, if we take a step back from this, this is really an amazing service, incredibly well organized, relentless in a way, like again, way more organized than I could ever be. I think it's also fair to say it's sending a very powerful message um, in the direction of screening. It's, it's pretty well a given that these letters assume that to take care of your health, you should be getting a mammogram. I think that, that equation really jumps out at me. Looking after your health equals getting mammography. And perhaps implied in that, I think for some people, is to not have a mammogram may be a little neglectful or errant in some way. Um, again, the, 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 um, our way of thinking about screening is illustrated in these letters. Dr. Sussman really went over that very well. That, Breast cancer is common. To find it, we need to find it early. Screening is the best way to find it early. And I guess what, what I'm starting to feel uncomfortable with in my practice and in, in conversations with women is there's, there's not really, um, there's not another side to the discussion being, being conveyed in these letters. Um, there's definitely no uh, acknowledgement that perhaps screening also has a downside or that there's other issues to consider for screening. There's not really a message that screening is potentially optional or that you can make a sane choice to screen or to not screen. Um, it's, it, I think there's a pretty strong imperative that says screening is not harmful, looking after your health means getting screening. So this patient that um, shared these letters with me is an interesting person. I wouldn't describe her as, very, as health anxious. She doesn't come in with um, 
you know, little, little nothings or, or a lot of health anxiety. But it's very important for her that she do the right thing. She wants to be a good patient. And she would be horrified if she didn't do what she was supposed to and something bad happened. For her, the, the impact of not doing what she's supposed to almost gives her more anxiety than um, being particularly worried about breast cancer or any health, uh, other health issues. She's sort of, she's not, uh, like I say, an overly anxious person, but I think the, the weight of these letters and the, the message of here's what you should do to look after your health actually felt like quite a burden to her. She had definitely decided that a mammogram was what she should do and came into my office to ask me the question that I now um, I've come to dread a little, which was, uh, I got my letters, and I'm, I'm planning to get a mammogram. Is that a good idea? So um, that is not an easy question to answer now. Um, and I'll, I just want to spend a few minutes about how I approach that question in my practice, but it's the, the intersection of this growing body of evidence and understanding what screening means for each individual is actually, I think, an, um, an art and a science that's very, very underdeveloped. And when this, when this woman who I know very well who wants to do the good thing comes and asks me should she get a mammogram or not, in some ways I want to tell her yes, because I know that's consistent with being good, but in another way I'm leaving out other important parts of, of the story and other important bits of information that she probably also deserves to have some access to that's going to make her more confused. And, and, um, and, and is that the right thing to do? I, I struggle with that. So um, in, in our offices, in, in our clinic, we've tried to give all of the clinicians uh, a little resource binder with some decision aids and some decision tools that help us through some of these difficult conversations. So mam mammogram screening is one of them. We have another tool for uh, prostate cancer screening, which is a whole other topic. But the one that... Um, the one that we use is from the Harding Center for Risk Literacy. And it's really compiled a lot of the evidence Dr. Sussman's just gone over and, and put it into a, a table form. And this is for women 50 years and over who, who are in the group that gets letters from Cancer Care in Ontario. And you know, it, it's reiterating the information that, that you've just seen. So we screen 1,000 women for 10 years. These are asymptomatic women who are walking through the door to make sure they're doing the right thing to prevent breast cancer. And we will prevent one death from breast cancer. There will still be four women who die from breast cancer because, the, as, as Dr. Sussman pointed out, it's, it's the biology of the cancer means that it will be set in motion and sometimes we, we can't do anything about the outcomes. We have not really prevented any cancer deaths because it turns out the one person that did not die of breast cancer um, potentially died from a different kind of cancer. So we're not living any longer as a total group with the mammograms. And then we see the, the um, potential harms for the women who receive screening. So 100 women will have a biopsy and go through the anxiety of, of that. And the estimates really vary, and this is a bit of a tough number to sort out, but there, there are potentially up to five women who had completely unnecessary treatment, who would have lived a normal life and had no surgery or intervention had they not had uh, a lesion discovered on the mammogram. So this is actually a really hard slide to go through with women because I, the message, I, I don't want to give the message that screening is a foolish thing to do. There are many, many reasons women ch still choose to receive screening and the, the anecdotes are powerful and family histories are powerful and a, and a belief in taking action can motivate women. And, and I actually don't feel it's that I have enough, uh, I don't have the ground to stand on to say, no, do not screen. I think that's the wrong message. But what I do feel I can say now is that choosing not to screen is very sane and can be completely consistent with, look, with caring about your health. And that I would, I would strongly support either choice, depending on what a, woman, what a woman felt was going to be best for her, knowing that, that these slides in this decision aid is also introducing probably a bit more confusion and uncertainty than she likely walked in with. So um, we're, we're left in a bit of a tough place. Um, there's also a nice, uh, for, for people who, who prefer a bit of a visual um, 
summary of the, of the same evidence, we have um, just a, a visual representation of the same numbers, of just giving you a sense of for, for the thousand women who undergo the, the procedure, who will receive benefit and who might receive some unintended consequences of harm due to biop false positive biopsies and so on, or even over-treatment for a cancer that was not ever going to cause a problem. Con um, confounding this, um, so actually, let me just finish. Uh, there's sort of another, there's another way of putting this. Um, and there's a, actually one of the, a couple of the studies that Dr. Sussman cited um, had Dr. Welch, who's done, done a, a tremendous amount of work in this. And Dr. Welch has used this analogy of um, screening is a bit like going to Vegas. Um, and when you go to Vegas, sometimes you win big and you're really, really glad you went. And sometimes when you go to Vegas, things don't turn out as you hoped. And we're stuck in this dilemma, I'd say, right now with mammography. So, there are some women whose lives are saved by mammograms. I think the evidence is really clear that, that that happens. Those are the big winners. They're very glad they went and they had a positive outcome. So in the, in the, the, the studies that I just showed you, which, which came from the Cochrane Center, um, it's, a, it's an international organization that takes all the high quality studies and tries to draw a conclusion by uh, assembling all of the results of those studies and putting them together. So with the best evidence we have now, we know that one per 1,000 women screened over 10 years will have their life saved by mammogram, and that is a very important life saved. However, the, uh, the story that is now coming out that I really struggle with in my office is that there are some people who, who are losers in the screening enterprise, and those are women who are having lesions discovered that would not threaten them and having unnecessary surgery or chemo, and those who are having the anxiety of, of false positives and biopsies and worrying about cancer. Confounding this, as if it sort of weren't confusing enough for women, um, as a physician, I am um, currently practicing in a, in a setting where I am given a fair amount of money to make sure all of my patients receive mammograms. So the, there's financial incentives for many of the models of care in Ontario of primary care, and we now have really great numbers on who's getting mammograms. So every year the government gets a report card on how well I am performing in my encouragement of women receiving mammograms. And it turns out if 75% of my women in the eligible age group do get a mammogram, I receive a bonus of $2,200 a year. So even within our practice group, there's, there's um, I would say that adds another dimension of tension around screening. Um, the, the money's really important to our clinical activities and actually helps fund some of the people we use to do quality assurance for us to make sure our care is the best possible. I personally feel really uncomfortable um, using that financial incentive to steer women in a direction that I think requires a lot more shared decision making than is, is currently the norm or is particularly comfortable. So I guess I'd just um, end with a few questions that I'm hoping we can bring to the discussion. Um, so really, if, if, if as we're discovering, screening does not change all-cause mortality, in essence, we're exchanging um, one cause of death for another and paying a lot of anxiety and worry for that exchange. So if mammograms are not saving lives, um, but causing some unnecessary harms, you know, is, is that the equation that we think we want to, to continue to support? Um, I just spoke about the, incentive, the financial incentives for screening. Very problematic. I think all screening tests vary in their effectiveness. Most of them do have some kind of um, risk of false positives and the anxiety that go with that and potentially risk of overdiagnosing and too much medicine. So as we enter environments where the quality of our care is measured and weighed more and more, the easiest thing to check off is, did this person get a screening test or not? It's much harder to check a box saying, did this person receive a meaningful discussion with their care provider about whether this is a good test for them or not? But I think that's a more ethical way to incentivize screening, is to really make it a shared decision-making process and not just merely a tick box that goes along with age. 
And, and I think Dr. Sussman alluded to this too. There is, um, there is a real imperative, I think, in, in our current medical culture where all forces align in the direction of screening and doing something. So um, it seems that the very worst thing that can ever happen in medical practice is what if something that could have been prevented is missed? You know, that really, really hits home. And we, I think, are, are slowly awakening to the other side of that equation, which is harms of too much medicine and the inadvertent harms we can cause by trying to be so active to prevent things. And I'm really heartened that the, the two sides of that equation are starting to, to, to come out into um, scientific discussion and slowly and painfully into discussions with patients because, of course, it, it just seems to make sense to do things as an active form of looking after ourselves, and it, it's much, much harder to recognize sometimes the unintended consequences of taking too much action or of, of the, the potential harms of too much medicine.